Hello. Hello. Welcome back. Well, we've hit Berlin. Check out this quintessentially cool urban um, Stellplatz that we're on in Berlin. <laughs> it's typical. Check this out. So we're going to try and use the train map, uh, jump on the underground, navigate our way around. The ticket machines, we've got to um, tackle them yet. Uh, we're going to look, see if we can get a three-day pass. Uh, the dog can travel. Mm. Do you want to yes. talk about the dog? Yeah, it's um, from what I've read before we came to Berlin, dogs can go on the trains. Um, if they are on, they have to be on a lead. Um, if they are travelling not in a... Um, a carrier, then they have to be muzzled, and if they're not in a carrier, then they have to have a ticket. That's as we understand it. So we'll uh, we'll let you know how we get on, whether that's the case. So if you do bring your dog to your, to, your dog to Berlin, then we'll have some up to date, correct advice for you. So without no more ado, we were onto the trains, and 20 minutes later, we're in the city centre of Berlin and making our way to the Brandenburg Gate. This is Berlin's historic neoclassical iconic structure and it symbolises both division and reunification. A short walk away is Berlin's parliament, or the German parliament should I say, the Reichstag. Built between 1884 and 1894, destroyed by fire in 1933 by the National Socialists at the start of their clandestine attempts to seize power, bombed heavily by the Allies in the war, and fell under the occupation of the Soviets during the Cold War. Post reunification of Germany, it was rebuilt by a British architect, Sir Norman Forster. The glass dome on the top is a symbol of openness and transparency and can be visited by the public. Berlin's history is troubled by its wartime record and its occupation by the Soviets, but both are accepted and dealt with without airbrushing it out. An example of this is this beautiful memorial to the Sinti and Roma people who were the subject of Nazi atrocities during the Second World War. Around the back of the Reichstag building, in glass, is written the Articles of the Human Rights Act. Article 12, Article 11, Article 10, and so on and so forth. And if you work your way around here, I can tell you that as we get to Article 2, Article 2 is right to life. I've studied the Human Rights Act on a number of occasions, and I have to say, there's nothing in it that I disagree with. Cut it burst. Cut it burst. Apparently it's required eating when you come to Berlin is to have the curry burst. Checkpoint Charlie is a must visit. It symbolises the division between East and West. It witnessed escapes, diplomatic tensions, and stands as an iconic symbol of the era. After the fall of the Berlin Wall, its significance diminished, but it remains to this day a historical site, representing the city's divided past. After World War II, Berlin was divided into four sectors controlled by the Allied powers. The United States, the Soviet Union, Great Britain and France. Checkpoint Charlie was established in 1947 as a crossing point between the American and Soviet sectors. A clear symbol of the Cold War, it's one of the main cross it was one of the main crossing points for diplomats, military personnel and foreign tourists travelling between East and West Berlin. The checkpoint was named after the NATO phonetic alphabet with Charlie representing the letter C. Checkpoint Charlie has witnessed several high-profile escapes and standoffs during the Cold War. Notably, in 1961, the construction of the Berlin Wall began, separating East and West Berlin. Many attempted daring crosses uh, across the checkpoint were made, some successful, others tragic. Checkpoint Charlie was also the site of diplomatic tensions between the United States and the Soviet Union. In 1961, a standoff occurred when American and Soviet tanks faced each other 
heightening fears of a potential conflict. Thankfully, the situation was de-escalated. The fall of the Berlin Wall on the 9th of November 1989 led to the eventual reunification of Germany and Checkpoint Charlie lost its significance. Good morning. Good morning. Day two in Berlin. Yes. We're going to hit the trains again this morning. We've made our way to Alexanderplatz. It's very clean, it feels very safe. Um, and behind me, probably just coming out the top of my head here, is the TV station. It's the one we actually saw when we were in Potsdam. The ride on the train was really good. Uh, this was on the underground today as opposed to the S-Bahn, which is, the S-Bahn is really like a local service. It's like partially underground, partially on the surface. Uh, but uh, this time today was on the underground. Uh, quite busy because it was busy time, uh, but not London busy, not crazy London busy. Uh, you can move around this city even when it's busy, really. Very good, all in all. Alexander Plaza is famous for its history, but also for its role to play in the silver screen. As Jason Bourne fans will recognise the location from the films. Named after Tsar Nicholas I, who visited Berlin in 1805, it gained significance in as a commercial district. It's a transport hub and connects the city in all directions. The TV tower at 368 metres is the tallest structure in Germany and a lift ride to the top is possible, but not with Poppy unfortunately. The world time clock displays times in various locations and cities and is a popular meeting place. Berlin Cathedral, or Berlin Dom as it's known, was originally uh, built several hundred years ago, but the current cathedral was completed in 1905. It's the home of the Protestant church in Berlin, and it's built on a late Renaissance and Baroque, Baroque style. It has a beautiful and ornate altar that's been highly decorated. Now you either like churches or you don't. We do, so we always visit. And the crypt here houses several Prussian royal family members. The interesting thing though is the view from the roof. More steps, 270 to be precise, to get to the top of the Berliner Dom. Keeping going, keeping going. Still 101 steps to go. <laughs> Made it to the top. 270 steps and a fantastic view of Berlin. I guess as you find with most city centres, the old just merges in with the new. Some very, very impressive buildings in Berlin. Well, 
that was day two in Berlin? Yes. Walked about seven and a half miles, haven't we? I can tell you. Oh, bear with me. Oh, it's all gone off. It's all gone wrong. 18,420 steps, eight miles. That's not bad. <laughs> we sit off and got off the trains. We used the train really well. Ellen went in and did some uh, negotiations with the for a tourist pass. Yes. So we ended up getting like a, a rail card in the sense that meant we could hop on and hop off. Although we'll perhaps use it more tomorrow, the hop on and hop. We have used it a bit today, mm. but probably more tomorrow. Um, so we've been down to Alexanderplatz. Alexanderplatz, yep. Uh, yep. Been and got a, a local data sim. Um, a little bit more expensive here than, in, mm. than in, when we were in Portugal and Spain. Uh, you don't get quite as many gigabytes for your money. That's how it works out. But it'll be fine. Um, I mean, sort of we're, um, we, so we've got that for the uh, Motorhome Wi-Fi system, which we'll plug in. Um, and we've got roaming on our phones mm. back on our UK contract. So that's how we'll, we'll manage that. Um, so, yeah, from there, really good walk round. Look at the cathedral. That was good, as you've probably seen the pictures by now. Um, and a nice steady stroll around the shopping place. Lots yeah. of nice shops down there. A bit of lunch, a bit of street food. Which I have to say was very good. It was, yeah. but we're trying to be good two days running. So, and then back, and a nice steady run back on the train. So, we've had a really nice day today. I'm going to chat this evening and uh, be up early and out again tomorrow. So, we'll pick you up then. Bye. Bye. <laughs>